since we are uh, studying excerpts from the Upanishads, I will begin as I've done uh, in our last class with uh, Shanti mantras from the Upanishads. These are the mantras usually chanted at the beginning of the study of these uh, sacred uh, dialogues. Om Shanno Mitra Shambarunaha Shanno Bhavatvar Yama Shanna Indro Brihaspatihi Shanno Vishnuru Rukramaha Namo Brahmane Namaste Vayo Tvameva Pratyaksham Brahmasi Tvameva Pratyaksham Brahma Vadishyami Ritam Vadishyami Satyam Vadishyami Tanmam Avatu Tadvaktaram Avatu Avatumam Avatu Vaktaram Om Shanti 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 Om Apyayantu Mamangani Vak Pranas Chakshu Srotramato Balam Indriyani Chasarvani Sarvam Brahmo Panishadam Maham Brahma Nira Kuryam Mama Brahma Nira Karod Anira Karanam Astvanira Karanam Me Astu Tadatmani Nirate Ya Upanishad Sudhar Maste Mai Santu Te Mai Santu Om Bhadram Karnevi Srunuyama Deva Bhadram Pashim Bhadram Pashim Akshabhiriya Jatraha Stirair Angair Tushtuva Gum Sastunu Bihi Vyashema Deva Hitam Yadayuhu Swastina Indro Vridhasravaha Swastina Pusha Vishwavedaha Swasti Nastrakshu Arishtane Bihi Swasti No Brihaspatir Dhadatu Om Sahana Vavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Sahaviryam Karavavahai Tejaswinavarhi Tamastu Mavid Vishavahai Om Shanti 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 In our last uh, satsang, we discussed a dialogue, at least a portion of a dialogue from the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, and we were introduced to Yagnya Valkya and his wife uh, Maitri. This dialogue gave us an opening, allowed us to talk about the significance of wealth in our lives. Uh, we discussed the necessity for wealth, but also the limits of wealth in relation to our spiritual journeys in relation to knowing the infinite one and in relation to liberating us from anxiety about death. Because this is the question that prompted this dialogue. Yagnya Valkya wanted to dispose of his wealth um, to his wives, Maitri and Katyayani, and Maitri asked him, will this wealth ensure me Amrita or immortal life? And so we explored uh, a portion of this uh, dialogue in, in great detail. Today, the dialogue I want to share with you comes from Chandogya Upanishad. So Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, 
belongs to Yajur Veda. Chandogya Upanishad uh, comes from the Sama Veda. So this is a dialogue from Chandogya Upanishad, chapter 6 of uh, this uh, text, regarded as one of the most important of the Upanishadic um, dialogues. And um, the two people involved in this dialogue, in the last one, it was a husband and uh, his wife, Yagnya Valkya and Maitri. In this case, it's a father, Aruni, and his son, Shweta Ketu. What this also reveals to you uh, by way of introduction is that these um, profound dialogues, these profound teachings were occurring in, in home settings in domestic uh, settings, not, in, not only or exclusively in monasteries, but uh, these were conversations, as we have seen, taking place between a husband and his wife, and in this case, between a father and his son. These were not confined to monks and, and monastics, but to people in domestic householder, uh, uh, settings. So here, as I said, we are introduced to the father whose name is Aruni and his son, Shweta Ketu. When uh, Shweta Ketu was 12 years old, his father, Aruni, informed him that it was time for him to commence his study of the of the Vedas, of the sacred uh, texts. His father said, Sri Taketu, there, has, there was never anyone in our family without learning who was unlearned. And so it is time for you to commence your religious uh, study. And so such study in this case required his son to leave his home uh, to become resident at the home of a, of a qualified teacher, a guru. So Sweta Ketu was born into a priestly family, a family in which there was a high value for, for learning. Following his father's instruction in chapter six, Sweta Ketu went to his teacher's ashram, to his guru's home. The ashram was the home of the, the guru uh, in those days and uh, lived with his teacher, lived in the ashram for 12 years. So he was 12 years and he studied with his teacher for another 12 years. Saha Dwadasha Varsha Upetya Chatur Vimshati Varsha Sarvan Veda Aditya. So for 12 years, he studied the, the Vedas with his uh, teacher. So we're not told whether he returned home during the course of those 12 years. Perhaps, perhaps not. Perhaps his, his parents visited him. The text does not tell us that, you know, like, like these sacred texts. It's, it keeps to the essentials, um, but it's interesting that it, it uh, provides this background um, to this uh, dialogue. So at the age of 24, this young man, Shweta Ketu, came back home. And uh, the Upanishad, very interestingly, is fascinating, uh, describes him in a few important words. What happened to him in these uh, 12 years when he was away from his parental uh, home? The text says that Shweta Ketu uh, returned Mahamana Anuchana Mani Stabda. He came back Mahamana. Mani means uh, conceited arrogant, Mahamana. He was, came back very conceited, 
very arrogant, full of himself, thinking of himself as a, a very learned person, demanding respect. Amani is one who demands respect from, from others. And it was pre present in him, present in him to a, a significant extent that the Upanishads say he was Mahamana, full of himself. Not only that, Anuchana Mani, so Mahamana, Anuchana Mani, regarding himself as the greatest among, among the Vedic scholars of his time. Anuchana Mani. There's no one thought that there was no one as learned as him, no one like him in uh, knowledge of the, of the sacred text, the sacred tradition. And the third word that the Upanishads used to describe him is stabda. Mahamana Anuchanamani Stabda. Stubborn. Obstinate. Fixed in his views. Uh, close minded. All of these uh, ways in which we could translate uh, Stabda. In fact, it is one of the terms used also in Bhagavad Gita. Uh, in chapter 16, verse 17, Krishna says, Atma Sambhavita Stabdaha describes uh, some people as Atma Sambhavita, full of themselves, Atma Sambhavita, and also Stabda, obstinate in their views, uh, not open minded uh, to other points of, of, of view. So, this is how. This young man came back home. In essence, he came back home without humility. His learning did not uh, bear the fruit of humility in his attitudes, in his disposition um, to, to life. Again, you know, Bhagavad Gita commends the learning. In, this is chapter 5, verse 18, and he uses the beautiful uh, phrase. Vidya Vinaya Sampanne. Vidya is knowledge. Vinaya is humility. Sampanna is wealth. Uh, here the Gita is commending that knowledge, that Vidya which is rich, which also has with it the wealth of humility. Vidya Vinaya Sampanne. This beautiful blend of learning and, and humility. But Shweta Ketu came back uh, the very opposite of this, of this ideal. His uh, learning made him conceited, arrogant, and obstinate. And as I said, it's very fascinating to me that the Upanishad actually describes him in this, in this way, it takes the time <laughs> to describe the mental attitudes of this student after his study of the of the sacred text. There's something that the text wants to communicate to us by prefacing the, the encounter between Aruni and his son in this, in this way. So naturally, uh, the father Aruni was troubled. What do you do? <laughs> we can put it in, transfer the story, change the time and the place of the story, of this narrative and ask ourselves, what do you do if your child goes to college and returns home like this? Conceited, thinking of himself as the most learned, obstinate in his uh, or her uh, views. What will a parent do? How should a parent react to, this, uh, to these constellation of attitudes in a, in a child? How do you move? Someone from conceit, from arrogance, from self-centeredness to humility. How do you how do you punch a hole in the ego of conceit um, so that it is it awakens to humility? Shweta Ketu's father was a gentleman, very we can see that throughout this conversation, how that he loved his son very much. And throughout this conversation, he uses very 
affectionate terms um, to speak to him at all times, my dear son, my beloved uh, son. He, he doesn't respond at any time um, with anger to his, his son. His language reflects a father who has you know, an unconditional love for his child. But at the same time, uh, in this uh, Upanishad, he's gentle, but he is firm and he is uh, truthful. So he says to him, Shweta Ketu, Yanu Somiedam, my dear child, my dear son, Mahamana Anuchanamani Stabdaha. You have come back from your study arrogant, conceited, thinking of yourself as the most learned among Vedic scholars, stabdaha, as I said, obstinate in your views. I want to ask you a question. Tama desha aprakshaya. Did you ask your teacher your, or your teachers for this knowledge? Did you question them? Did you inquire about this? What is that? Yena srutam srutam. Did you ask them about that which is unheard of but becomes heard of? Yena srutam srutam. Bhavatya matam matam. That which is untaught of, becomes taught of. Avigyatam, vigyatam, that which is unknown, becomes known. So did you ask about that knowledge as a result of which that which is not unheard of becomes heard of? That which is not thought of becomes thought of. That which is unknown becomes known. Did you ask that? Did you ask them about that? Swetha Ketu says, what is that? Katham nu bhagavaha sa adesho bhava iti. What is that? Is there something like that? Is there some, is there some knowledge like that? Do you mean to say there is something that I don't know? Um, is there some wisdom that I, I lack? Some subject that I did not, did not study? So observing, as I said, his son's arrogance, his father wanted to awaken him to humility by letting him know that his learning is not complete. That there is something that he returned not knowing. There is some lack, there is some deficiency in his, in his uh, knowledge. So did you ask for that teaching? by which what has not been heard of becomes heard of, what has not been thought of becomes thought of, what is unknown becomes known. So he wanted, in other words, to disabuse him, him of his pretensions by getting him to recognize the limits of his, of, his, of his knowledge. And that's what, you know, as I asked before, how do you move someone from arrogance to humility. And uh, I think clearly one of the most important ways is by helping that person to recognize the limits of his or her knowledge. Humility is a consequence of acknowledging the limits of one's understanding. And this is exactly what Shweta Ketu's father um, wanted to do. So I think one of the fundamental obstacles to learning is not ignorance, but it is arrogance. It is thinking that one knows everything. One has all the answers. This is a, a fundamental. You can't teach. <laughs> An arrogant person is very difficult to teach. An ignorant person who is open to learning is teachable. 
an arrogant mind that is close to learning is fundamentally uh, uh, un, un, unteachable. So humility, Vinaya, is a gift of recognizing the limits of one's knowledge. And as I said, Aruni does not become angry with him, but gently asks him this question. Did you learn about this? Did you ask your teachers for this uh, wisdom? So he, in response, as I said, Spirit of Ketu says, what is this? Is there knowledge like this that I did not inquire about? And then Aruni goes on in this Upanishad to give his son a taste of what he's talking about, a glimpse of what he's talking about, because Svetaketu seems to be seems to be doubting the possibility of a knowledge that he lacks. So his father gives him a series of very important and, and very famous and beautiful uh, metaphors in the in the in the Chandogya uh, text. He says it's like this. Yatha somya, somya is I call it. It is like this, my dear son. Yatha somya kena, mrit pindena sarvam mrinmayam vigyatam syad, vacharambhanam vikaro namadheyam, mrittike deva satyam. Yatha, just it is like this, just as mrit pindena. By knowing mritpindena, what is one lump of clay? Just as by knowing what a lump of clay is, mritpindena, we can say sarvam mrinmayam vigyatam syat. One comes to know all clay. One comes to know the nature of all that is made out of clay. By knowing the truth or the nature of one lump of clay, one can come to know the nature of, of all clay, vigyatam syad, because vacharambanam vikaro namadheyam, because the differences between one lump of clay or some artifact, some object made out of clay, or if you have, a, if you have many objects made out of the same clay material, the difference between them is really a difference in name, nama dhyayam. You know, one is a jug, one is a bowl, one is a plate, but the essence, the, the fundamental reality of them all is, is clay. So if I know one clay vessel, even though there's a beautiful diversity in the other forms of clay, but I know the essence of clay. And therefore, I know the essence of all that is made out of out of clay. So he says, "This is what, this is the knowledge that I'm speaking about. It is like this." And then he goes on with similar examples. He says, uh, "Just as my dear, my dear son, just as by one piece of gold, everything made of gold may be known, the difference being only a difference of name, vikaro nam adhyayam." arising from speech, vacharambhanam, while the truth is that it is all gold. So in that case, mrittiket yeva satyam, the truth is clay. In this case, the truth is, is gold. The differences are differences of name and, and, and form. So when Shwet Ketu, through these examples that his father offers to him, glimpse the possibility of a teaching with which he was not acquainted, something he had never heard before. It is interesting, and the Upanishad tracks this boy's attitude. He said to his father, surely said Sveta Ketu, my teachers did not know this. Because <laughs> if they had known it, why would they not have taught me? So he blames his teachers. <laughs> it is their fault. It is not my fault that I, I did not know this. It is my teacher's fault. They did not teach me about it. And therefore, they did not know uh, this teaching that you are sharing with me. 
Of course, <laughs> what uh, Shweta K2 uh, did not consider is that his teachers did not discuss this with him because of his own lack of interest. He had an inquisitive mind. His desire to know more was aroused by his, his father. This is his saving quality that he, he has this. He does have an inquisitive uh, mind, but he's still blaming um, his teachers for his, uh, for his ignorance. I say this because in the tradition of the Upanishads, and of course that's the tradition we are speaking of, we, we may assume that the teachers did not instruct Shweta Ketu about this reality because he never asked. The tradition, of course, his, what his father is speaking about here is the knowledge of Brahman, the infinite absolute reality that from which all has come, that by which everything is sustained, that to which everything returns. And you can see, see the example that he uses, the example of clay from which all clay pots or all clay vessels, all clay artifacts have come, that by which they sustain and that to which they, they return. So that's ex exactly what the father uh, is going to instruct his son about. And this knowledge in the Upanishadic tradition was imparted only upon request. One had to demonstrate a deep interest before the teachers of the Upanishads would instruct. So we have so many beautiful verses that emphasize this. Again, you know, Bhagavad Gita, chapter 4, verse 30, 34, tad vidhi pranipatena pariprashnena sevaya upadekshyantite jnanam jnaninas tattvadarshinaha. Tad vidhi, seek that. Seek that knowledge, seek that truth, how? Paripatena, by going to a teacher, by taking the initiative to approach a teacher. The teacher doesn't come, you, you go to the teacher. You indicate your interest by taking the initiative to approach a teacher, paripatena, and then pariprashnena, by asking question, interrogating the teacher in humility, sevaya serving in humility and questioning uh, the teacher. Upadekshyan tite jnanam, jnanina tattva darshina. This is, this is when uh, a guru will, will teach, when a student requests um, knowledge. This is why, you know, we, in, in the Upanishadic tradition, the teachers didn't go out to seek students, students sought out the teachers as an in as an indication of their profound interest in in learning. There's other verses in the Upanishads uh, speaking similarly to the Bhagavad Gita. Mundaka Upanishad has a very famous verse on this point as well. Parikshalokan karmachitan brahmano nirveda mayat nastya krita kritena tad vigyanartham sa guru meva vigachet Samit Panihi Srotriyam Brahmanishtam. You know, when one, uh, as this text is, when one examines the world and one comes to understand the limits of all finite gains and accomplishments, one comes to understand that the uncreated is not created by any action. What does one do? Tad Vigyanartam Saguru Meva Vigachet. Then you go to a teacher. You approach a teacher, Guram Meva Bhigachit, Samit Panihi, again, with humility, Srotriyam Brahmanishtam, and mentions the, describes the Guru as one who knows the, the tradition, Srotriyam, knows the Sruti, knows the Veda, and uh, exemplifies those teachings in his or her 
life through Tiriam, one who knows and one who lives, manifests the teaching in this um, life. So to help his son understand the nature of this one, this one reality, this one truth, nature of Brahman and Brahman's relationship with the universe, with the cosmos, uh, Sri Taketu's father, Aruni, uses some of the most famous analogies in the Upanishads. I've mentioned, as I said, two of these, the analogy about clay and clay objects, gold and gold ornaments. Each one is suggestive, each one complements each other, each one enriches um, the other. But the one that I want to focus a little bit with you um, this morning is um, prompted by the fact that they were obviously father and son sitting under a, a, a tree in the yard of their home. And it was a banyan tree, Nigrodha. It was a banyan tree, a spreading, beautiful banyan tree. And um, Shweta Ketu's father, Aruni, asked his son to, to fetch a fruit of this banyan tree and to bring it um, to him. Nyagrodha palam ata ahara. Please bring me a fruit of this banyan tree. And Shweta Ketu brings it, he says, Iram Bhagavaha iti. Here it is, my father. And uh, the father says to him, Bhindhi iti. Break it, my son. Open this fruit for me. And the boy breaks it. Bhinnam Bhagavaha. It is broken. I have broken it. Kimatra Pashyati iti, says the father. Kimatra Pashyati iti. What do you see there? My son, now that you have broken this fruit, what do you see? What are you uh, seeing? And Sweta Ketu says, Anvya Iva Imaha Dhanaha. I see Imaha Dhanaha. I see many tiny seeds in this fruit. This fruit is full of tiny, tiny seeds. Dana. So then the father continues, says, Asam ekam bhindhi. Take one of these seeds in, in the palm of your hand and I want you to break it. Break one of the seeds. Break one of them. Angaiti. So Sri Ketu follows his father. These are very tiny seeds. And he, he breaks that seed. Bhinna Bhagava iti. It is broken. Kimatra Pashyati iti. What do you see now? So we, you know, the Upanishad may have condensed here a bit. Perhaps he asked him to break again. But the text moves on. He doesn't want to enumerate how many times <laughs> he, he asks his son to break this uh, tiny seed. But it says, it comes to the point when he asks his son, Kimatra Pashyati Iti, what do you see now? What do you see now? What do you see now? And then uh, Sweta Ketu says, Nakinchana Bhagava Iti, I don't see anything. Nothing. Nakinchana. I'm not seeing anything again. And then dad says, again, very lovingly to him, my dear son, Sri Taketu, that which you are saying you don't see, that which you are saying is invisible to you, that finest essence which you do not see, etadvai animanam, that subtle, reality that you don't that you're saying you do not see from that from that from that etasya vai anima esha mahanya grodha from that this gigantic banyan tree has come 
what you say you do not see, that invisible, subtle essence that you do not perceive, please understand that that is the source of this gigantic banyan tree. It is because of that, that it tishtati, because of that it exists and it stands. So why did Aruni have faith, he said. Sradhastva somya iti. Sradhastva soma somya iti. Have faith, my son. From that which you say you cannot see, this tree has come. Have faith. Interesting. Why does he ask his son to have faith? Have faith. Sradhatva swa soma iti. So now uh, see what has happened in this in this conversation. He asked his son to divide one of the banyan trees until his son was not able to divide it any further, until he could see nothing. What his father wants him to understand, to appreciate, is that the fact that he could see nothing does not mean that there is nothing. The fact that he was not able to see anything does not mean nothingness, doesn't mean the absence of reality. He thought that there was nothing. He said, "Na kinchana bhagava iti." I see nothing, Father. So by dividing this seed, he arrived at a level in the nature of the seed, which is no longer available for perception through the sense organs. You never arrive at nothingness. You can never destroy something into a condition of non-existence. That's a basic fact of, uh, of science. But he had reached a level in the nature of that seed, which was no longer available for sense, sense perception. He, re he reached the invisible essence of the seed. It was not reduced to nothingness. Nothing could be destroyed. So he could not perceive, no longer perceive the invisible essence of the seed through his senses, because of that, at that level, reality, whether it's the reality of the seed or anything else in our universe, does not have characteristics that are knowable through our sense organs, through the five sense organs. This does not mean, however, that the invisible essence, essence of the seed is irrelevant. As his father says, it is because, because of this that which you can see, this invisible essence that this gigantic tree stands uh, today, that it exists. The invisible is the source of the, of the visible. In the absence of the invisible, the visible cannot be explained. So faith in this case is necessary because the existence of the, the seed's essence cannot be verified in the same manner as objects that are seen, heard, touched, or, or smelled. Eyes can only, we have discussed this, you know, previously in study of texts like Kena Upanishad and Nirvana Shatakam, but the eyes can only perceive objects that have form. Each sense object is capable of apprehending a particular, each sense organ is capable of apprehending a particular object, form, smell, touch, taste, sound, um, etc. So like in the Katha Upanishad, uh, the teacher there describes this reality, Brahman, as ashabdam, without sound, asparsham, without touch, arupam, without form, arasam, not, not available for tasting, agandhavat, not available for the sense of, of, of uh, smell because it is not a limited uh, object. Today, 
we are in a much better position, even compared to the time of the Upanishads when Aruni spoke to his son, Shweta Ketu, and he said, have, have faith, my son. Why are we in a better position? I'm saying so because we know that most of our physical universe, including such things as subatomic particles or radioactive waves, just to give a few examples, cannot be perceived through the senses. Science speaks comfortably today about the invisible that, according to some views, account for 90% of our, of our universe. Not only is the existence of the invisible conceded, but many scientists would, would argue that this invisible precedes the visible. The visible, the invisible is the source of the visible. The invisible world is needed to account for and to explain the, the visible. So Aruni's teaching to his son that a subtle, in, subtle invisible reality, which is the essence of this tree and is the ground of its existence is remarkably similar to contemporary accounts of the origin and nature of the universe. Let me give you um, one example from uh, Paul Dirac. Uh, who is the father of anti-matter. And he wrote many years ago. I'm, I'm quoting from, from Paul Dirac. All matter is created out of some imperceptible substratum. This substratum is not accurately described as material since it uniformly fills all space and is undetectable by any observation. In this sense, it appears a nothingness, immaterial, undetectable, omnipresent. But, writes Dirac, it is a peculiar form of nothingness out of which all matter is created. In other words, it is not nothingness. <laughs> it is reality. It is, it, its nature is a reality that is unavailable for perception or recognition through our limited sense organs. It's a quite a remarkable statement from a, a, a highly respected um, uh, scientist. Now that reality, I'm, and I'll, I'll clarify, I'm not equating what Dirac describes as um, antimatter, but in the Upanishads, that which he's trying to describe, let's put it in that way, the ultimate cause, the finest essence out of which everything has come, by which everything is sustained, by which everything is in which everything is grounded, is what the Upanishads speak of as Brahman. So while Dirac was not referring to uh, Brahman, but what, what interests me is that his description of the source of matter is, is interesting since he speaks of it in, in similar language. It is imperceptible, it is non-material, it is undetectable, and yet it is necessary for explaining everything that is perceptible, detectable, that it is uh, seen. In other words, he describes, he describes this as the subtlest of all realities. The Sanskrit word is sukshma, sukshmatvat. The Upanishads, Bhagavad Gita would describe Brahman as sukshmatvat, the subtlest of all, of all subtle um, realities, and I just cited for you Katha Upanishad, which says that, that reality is without sound, without touch, without form, without taste, and uh, without uh, uh, a smell. So Aruni is drawing his son's attention to the fact that Brahman, um, the fundamental cause of all things, is not discernible uh, through the uh, senses. And he goes on to say, you know, that that which you cannot see, which is the essence of this seed and this huge banyan tree, and this is a very important connection that Aruni makes in this conversation. 
what is true about the nature of this seed that at, at its most fundamental, indivisible, let me put it in that way. He was asking his son to divide this seed until he was until he reached a point where it was no longer div divisible. He had reached the indivisible essence of the seed, avibhaktam, avibhaktam, that which is no longer divisible. That's where he want, That's what he wanted his son to understand that that the reality of this seed is the indivisible essence, which is of course the source of the huge banyan uh, tree. That is the truth of everything that exists. Anything that you divide will eventually bring you to a reality that is indivisible. And so later in this conversation, he goes on to say, that is the truth of all that exists. That is the satyam, the truth of all that exists. And then in the course of this conversation, we have the famous statement, tattvamasi. That and that thou art, <laughs> Shweta Ketu, that thou art. That invisible essence from which everything has come, by which everything is sustained, to which everything returns. The invisible essence of this beautiful, majestic, gigantic Banyan tree is your own self, your own essence. And 12 times <laughs> he repeats, Tatwamasi, Tatwamasi, Tatwamasi. And uh, that is what you, you are. So when it comes to making claims about the nature of ultimate reality, my point is the language of science gets closer to the language of the Upanishads. Um, this is necessarily so, since reality at this level is not available for, for observation, and even science has to become poetic in, <laughs> in talking about it. There's no way to talk about it other than in the language of poetry, um, in the language even of, uh, of uh, paradox. And both require a certain kind of fate, um, because we are dealing in the realm of that which transcends um, ordinary perception. But before I conclude, let me at least introduce to you that I am not saying in, in this discussion that, say, Dirac's view of the of matter, or at least of subtle matter, invisible subtle matter, which he's proposing as the cause of all that we we see is identical to the Upanishadic understanding of Brahman. I think there's some fundamental um, differences um, between these two uh, worldviews. World Brahman, like, like Dirac's substratum, is indeed the, the cause of all that exists. We might even want to say the material cause of all that exists. But Brahman is much more in the Upanishads. Brahman is not inert matter. It is not an inert reality like Dirac's um, material cause. The Upanishads describe Brahman in a beautiful Taittiriya uh, sentence, Satyam Jnanam Anantam Brahma. So Brahman is indeed Satyam, the fundamental cause, the truth of all that exists, right? It is the fundamental ground of all that exists, but Brahman is also Jnanam, Satyam Jnanam. Dirac doesn't use that terminology for um, his cause, but the Upanishad describes Brahman as Jnanam, which is consciousness. Consciousness, jnanam. In other words, Brahman is not an, an unconscious, indifferent, static 
matter. As with consciousness that is intrinsic to Brahman, the Upanishads attribute will to this one. Brahman has willed the, the, the world of diversity out of itself. May I become many. May I multiply myself is the language of the Upanishads. So we may even want to say, you know, another, because the word Purusha is also used for, for Brahman. In other words, Purusha, Brahman is, is nothing less, it is much more than what we understand in our anthropomorphic terminology by person. But let me put it in this way by saying that Brahman is not, is not, is not less than what we mean by person. So certainly much more than what we mean by, by person. But I, I want to, my point is that, you know, we have to distinguish an inert material cause, which is, if I would use, you know, Sanskrit language, uh, I would say what Dirac is talking about comes closer to the notion of Prakriti. Prakriti, which is a fundamental material substratum. But Brahman is, is much more than, than, than Prakriti. And Brahman can be described as Purusha, as personal being. As I said, not, not in anthropomorphic terms, but certainly um, a being with will and an intention and much greater than than um, Prakriti. That's that's one important difference that, you know, there's much more to be said about that, but I just wanted to introduce that um, point. My second point is where, where I think there's a important um, distinction is that when I know, let's think with me for a moment. Let us say that I understand, you know, I'm using Dirac this morning, I understand his point of view that all visible reality has emerged out of this invisible, omnipresent um, material cause. Let me say that I, I understand that and I even uh, accept that. That knowledge does not really make much difference to me. I can know that and I can continue with my life normally tomorrow. It does not transform my self-understanding, nor does it transform my relationships with other human beings or all, with, with other sentient beings. I don't want to limit it to human beings. I, I, I would include also the world of nature. It doesn't transform my relationship. Let me put it in the most inclusive way with the universe. But the knowledge of Brahman, which as he keeps on telling his son, that thou art, that thou art, that thou art, makes a difference, a fundamental, I would say, fundamental moral and ethical difference. Scientific knowledge does not have the capacity to transform us ethically, morally. It has not done so yet. But this knowledge, Tatvamasi, is a transformative knowledge. When I, when I understand that I am that, I also understand that you are that, as the Father says, you know, that which is the invisible essence of this seed is the invisible essence of everything that exists. When we understand the truth that this is the self, it is the self of all. And that wisdom, that vijnana, moves us, awakens us to a compassionate way of being, a generous way of being, a, a loving way of, of being. It is a transformative knowledge. And you will see in the Bhagavad Gita, in the Upanishads, that the fruits of this understanding are always spelled out. They are always listed. Um, knowledge, this knowledge has ethical implications for our relationships with, with, with the universe. If it is not doing that, then, you know, we have not fully integrated um, what it, what it um, 
means it is it transforms us into beings of compassion beings of love beings of um, generosity beings committed to each other's well-being to the to the common good to the flourishing of all it liberates us from hate uh, from violence these are all the fruits that are that um, listed it gives fulfillment it would ananda is also used for for brahman brahman is a source of of um, fulfillment all this terminology is not you know we're not fine in in dirac's um, account but i thought i should share that because there is such fundamental there is a fundamental similarity in the language and my point here is that you know the upanishads are not inconsistent with what we are increasingly learning about the nature of reality about the nature of our of our universe and i think it's a remarkable example aruni's example to shri taketu of breaking down that seed and until it's no longer visible is one of the most remarkable examples used in a sacred text to speak about the divine as the ground the the, the ultimate truth of all that exists and as one's own own self i have a question yes yes go ahead, go ahead please naina no. okay well, first of all on a lighter note i uh, wish that uh, shweta ketu would have been homeschooled rather than sent <laughs> off <laughs> but um, apart from that it was a wonderful discussion and i'm increasingly amazed at how our ancient um, gurujis and uh, mentors etc knew so much about science without actually seeing anything like evidentiary like atom splitting or electron um what 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 are those uh um whatever they are you know the scientific tools or something to see what and um you, you know i'm i just just wanted to have you clarify so something does not come from nothing mm-hmm. it there is a something there i mean there's a base and you can define it as brahman but and it's not matter Mm-hmm. then it's still hard for me to conceptualize what it it is it is undefinable but um you know and it is just an article of faith so is that what it is well a very good uh, question <laughs> nana that requires a, a very extensive um discussion so let me um first of all uh say you know i agree with the, the, the uh, appreciate what you prefaced your your question um with which is the the convergence of the upanishads with certain um scientific understandings of of um of reality and that's, that's quite um that's quite remarkable and it's, it's why I, it's always important to keep in mind because there is as i said i think a couple of classes ago you know there is a rise in the western world today of a, a, a what's called a new atheism and there are many um, books written you know in in view of in in support of this um new or neo neo atheistic um perspectives but you know as some close observers would uh, would say none of them are really dealing with the upanishadic understanding of brahman they are, they are dealing much more with certain um anthropomorphic views of god as a reality outside of this uh, universe here what is what we must always keep in mind that the upanishadic understanding of brahman is is that brahman is the ground the ultimate ground and source of all that that exists that is that is not an that is not a, 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 a an understanding that is easily is refuted by current um atheistic arguments so but your question has a different um focus which is you know how can we um if i heard you correctly we still 
can't prove the existence of, of this Brahman, of this, of this reality. What I can say um, uh, in to that question is that, you know, as, as human beings, in the, in the Chandogya Upanishad, in fact, the teacher says at one time, when he says, when Aruni says that, that out of this one in the beginning, he puts it in this way, in the beginning before anything came into being, there was this one. Sadeva, Somya, Idamagra, Asit, Ekameva, Advitya. He says that there was this one being, this one reality before anything came into existence. And he says, some say that before this universe came, to, came into being, there was nothing. There was nothingness. And from nothing, something came. And then, but then he raises, he says, but how is that possible? How can something come out of out of nothing. So he, he, he argues against the illogic of claiming that, that something can come out of, out of um, nothing. So we have to ask ourselves, a very difficult question, but we have to ask ourselves because as I said before, from a strictly logical point of view, I should not be talking to you this morning. You should not be listening to me this morning. There should be nothing. There should be. There should not be a universe. But the fact is that there is. Right? <laughs> that there is. There should logically be nothing. But the fact is that there is. And how do you account for that? You know, where does it? Where did it come from? We can spend a lot of our, of our time, you know, uh, uh, tracing, you know, cause and effect. As as I think Sweet. Aruni is trying to do in this example. So you take anything, uh, you take the tree, and you try to, to see what is it. Get, get to its fundamental cause. And you do that, you know, today in science, as you quite rightly said, you know, we have the big experiment going on in, in CERN in Switzerland to get to, to get to get to the ultimate constituents of reality, the ultimate nature of reality by breaking. What he's asking his son to do is to is to break things into their finer and finer <laughs> realities. So as ancient as the Upanishad, we are using instruments um, to do it. Now, we can do that and, uh, and you could anticipate going into a kind of an infinite regress. Everything has a cause. So we go back, 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 you know, the effect, the, this effect has this cause, this effect has that cause, this effect has that cause. You can imagine an, an, an in, infinite um, regress, which is not, uh, I mean, from the Upanishadic point of view, that is not very meaningful. The, the Upanishadic views that ultimately we will, we're going to come to some reality that is indivisible, that can't be broken further. That is Brahman. That is the ground of all things. And most importantly, Nayana, that is not out there. <laughs> Mm -hmm. That is the truth of everything that exists. And remember that line, Tatwamasi, and this is your own self. So to doubt in the Upanishadic perspective, to doubt the existence of Brahman is to doubt your own existence. Mm -hmm. Is to deny your own existence, which we can't do. So Shankara, a last point I'll make. Mm -hmm. Shankara, the great commentator on the Upanishad says, that the one thing a person does not have to prove is whether he exists or not. Because once you say, okay, you begin to prove or to even think about whether you exist or not, you already exist. And that's why you could even think about it. So the existence, he says, the, the existence of Brahman, the self, does not require proof. It is, it is self-evident. It is self-evident. To deny Brahman is to deny one's own one's own self. That's a, a brief answer. Um, question of this extensive discussion. John. Uh, John, I saw I, you. I, I found this totally inspiring. And I, I thought I might offer one ex potential extension. You, you drew this, this beautiful picture of ways in which the Iraq's view is like the Upanishadic view and ways in which it's different. Yes. And the presence of consciousness is one of those differences. 
yes. there is a stream of thinking emerging within science and the philosophy of science that you could say acknowledges that and says that we do we do not have a way a scientific way of explaining consciousness it is of a different nature than physical reality is mm -hmm. and what we need to do mm -hmm. is we need to reshape our conception of the physical of the attributes of physical reality by incorporating among the attributes that physicists assign also at least the potential for yeah. consciousness if you assemble the components in the right way later on. So it, it leaves space for the evolution of the kind of self-awareness that we humans have. Yes. But it says the reason we are able to have that is that it is one of the fundamental attributes mm -hmm. of physical reality. Yes, yes. No, that's a very good point, um, uh, John. I, I thank you so much for you know bringing it to our discussion this morning. You know, uh, and I would just not 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 in, um, just to add to what you what you said. I think it's it's very logical logical in, in this sense that, look, you know, if we think of ourselves, John, certainly our bodies, our minds as effects, then everything that we are, you know, both as physical or mental beings, including, as you say, consciousness, we have to admit that whatever might be the cause of what we are, that these these characteristics were present in that cause, right? They were present in that in that in that cause. And if if I have if I am a conscious being, then the source from which I came, uh, you know, was conscious or or had the. I don't want to use the word property because that's not good with the Upanishads, but. <clears throat> Had the characteristic, let me say, of, of, of consciousness because the effect, you know, the, the effect is not is not different from the cause. The effect reflects the reflects the um, the cause. The of course the big argument uh, between the Upanishadic perspective and some materialistic perspectives, if I would put it in that way, is that is the argument that Consciousness is a is an epiphenomena, as we will say. You know, it is a product. It is it is a product of the interaction of of neurons uh, and the firings of neurons in in the brain. In other words, it comes into being. Um, it is not always present. It is not a fundamental. It is not fundamental to the very structure of reality, which is what you are reminding of us of, I, as I hear you. That some some. Some scientists are uh, making that argument, which I think is very close to the Upanishad. So the argument that consciousness is intrinsic to the very structure of reality is one way of putting it. But the the the, the argument that it is an epiphenomena that is somehow generated um, by ma material forces or material interactions is one that the Upanishads would not would not. Um, uh, accept. Uh, as you said, you know, the nature of consciousness is perhaps one of the most elusive questions for neuroscience um, today. Yes. Um, Bharat Ji? Uh, yeah, I have uh, three different things I want to bring up uh, pertains to your talk today. Uh, early part of the walk, talk, you mentioned how Upanishad uh, requires the student to ask a question. Unless the student asks the question, the guru may not be uh, responding. Well, that reminds me of something which is interesting, just a little anecdote. Uh, Robert Oppenheimer, you know, the famous physicist, yes. when he was a student at Harvard, wanted to go to Oxford for graduate study. So he asked his advisor, a very famous uh, 
magnetic uh, uh, magnetism uh, scholar for recommendation. And so his advisor wrote one sentence recommendation for o Oppenheimer, and that was, he has the courage to ask questions. <laughs> and, and that was enough for Oppenheimer to get admission at Oxford, a very prestigious position. The other thing is, in your, you began by bringing up the issues of arrogance, uh, uh, obstinacy, all of the uh, various impediments we have in progressing through our lives to make a you know, wise uh, future for ourselves. Uh, and that was the point that his father wanted to address. While what his father eventually showed us is very profound and I was very touched by the whole story of the bunion tree and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I didn't get any kind of uh, understanding of how the student will recognize his folly or his lack of, uh, I mean, he would still be very, uh, it, it, it somehow didn't connect to me, for me, the, uh, the issue of his becoming aware. Of course, he became aware of something very profound. Yes. But how did that connect with his uh, worldly sense of who he was? I, I didn't get that. In other words, how does one in one's own life transform their lives by this knowledge? You know, what is it that you know, how is it that this transformation takes place? I didn't see that come. And mm -hmm. finally, I just want to bring a third, something that you and John were discussing, consciousness. So one of the things that's happening, I think, in contemporary physics and this whole knowledge of reality is this idea that's very basic in quantum mechanics is that the entire universe or matter or whatever, is all expressed in terms of wave functions. And so as such, our thoughts are also could be thought of in terms of wave functions. Our emotions could be thought of. So while that fundamental reality could be in the form of a wave functions, only time it becomes specific is when you put an intention to it. So that's when it forms, like in quantum mechanics, we have this uncertainty principle where, you know, if you observe something, you no longer know its complement. So this idea of uh, shifting uh, sense of how we focus something, you lose focus on the rest of it. Uh, comes in, but it all is a part of the entire uh, uh, you know, being uh, propagated as wave functions in infinitely in time and space and everywhere, including within ourselves. And so that, to me, seems like the connection uh, that perhaps if one wanted to make to Brahman, that one could think of as a starting point, because the nice thing about quantum mechanics and wave functions is that it provides us tools to create uh, linkages and ties through mathematical formulations. So we have a, some kind of a model. So see, part of the problem I have with our ancient knowledge is that as I think Naina brought up, we have to kind of leave it to faith. We don't somehow have a model in our head on how to uh, structure that understanding. And I feel that scientific knowledge or knowledge now that's trying to blend uh, physical universe, psychology, you know, the subtle conscious, uh, all of these various levels into one formulation perhaps may be moving towards this uh, ideal realization of the Brahman as a part of us. It is us, so to speak. Anyway, that's just the 
a thought. Okay. Thank you very I don't much. I don't have it formulated or I don't have the answer for it. This is what we get together in such things to do, Bharatji. Thank you for um sharing. I um I mean there is so much in what you what you said again. Perhaps we, we need to continue this discussion in a subsequent um satsang. It is true. Um you know, the value of sraddha is emphasized, but it is not a sraddha that is uh, irrational. It is not a sraddha that is contrary to, um, it is contrary to reason. It is, it is a sraddha that is necessary because, you know, we are dealing with a reality that is not <clears throat> measurable um, or discernible or detectable in uh, by the kinds of processes um, that uh, we study the universe in, in science. But as you yourself indicated, it's interesting how these two worlds are coming closer and closer in, in understanding the very nature of reality. On the question of the transformation of Sweta Ketu, you know, I, I just give a selective excerpt from that dialogue. I think uh, clearly when we look at the totalities, it's quite an extensive dialogue in, in Chandogya. I mean, I, I would want to say that he did move from arrogance to uh, humility um, as this dialogue um, progressed. And, uh, you know, the, the knowledge, the transformation that is brought about by knowledge is something that is a, it's a process. It is, it's not an instantaneous um, action in in time, um, because we, if we assume that there's a certain understanding of ourselves and the nature of the universe that will move us in a different way from self-centeredness to other-centeredness, from selfishness to compassion, from, from miserliness to uh, generosity, that, that transformation is, that ethical transformation is, is, a, um, is a process. But I thank you. I thank you, uh, Bharatji. Thank you, John. Thank you, um, Naina, for your contribution. Let us close with um, with a, a mantra. And um, it's good to be in satsang and to have this uh, very stimulating discussion with with all of you. Let us let us conclude. Om Purnamadaf Purnamidam Purnaat Purnamudachyate. Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti Shanti Shanti